Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of motion, motion to start again. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11906 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for this week. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11906. Moved. Thank you. No members asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11906 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. We move now to topical questions. Question one, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government on devolving the power to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in Scottish parliamentary elections. Deputy First Minister. Presiding Officer, this issue was discussed when the Prime Minister and the First Minister met yesterday. The Prime Minister gave a commitment that the necessary transfer of powers will be undertaken in time to allow the Scottish Parliament to extend the franchise to 16- and 17-year-olds for the 2016 elections. Both governments are now working to develop a Section 30 order, which will require to be agreed by the United Kingdom Parliament by March 2015 to fulfil this commitment and to deliver this as swiftly as possible. Claire Adamson. Thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. I'm sure that we welcome across the Chamber um, this news. The 2014 referendum was exceptional in its public engagement and interest, and young people were at the core of that civic engagement, culminating in the fantastic event at the Hydro, at which my own son was in attendance. What measures will the Scottish Government take to ensure that young people are, are informed and engaged in the 2016 election, as they have been in the referendum campaign? Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, the, uh, the, the, the event to which, um, or the events to which Claire Adamson refers of the, uh, the debate in the Hydro, which involved many thousands of 16 and 17 year old voters uh, in Scotland, uh, which was viewed, I think, pretty objectively to be one of the best and the most effective debates of the entire referendum campaign, coupled to the uh, enormous participation by 16- and 17-year-olds in voting in the referendum, I think give us uh, great confidence in the future of Scotland and great confidence in the democratic participation of young people in our country. Uh, the Government took steps as a consequence of the consultation exercise that we undertook about encouraging civic participation in the run-up to the referendum, of the importance of ensuring that we uh, supported through uh, the educational system, uh, the increased political literacy of young people and exploring ways in which young people could uh, participate in, 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 in our wider democratic politics. In the programme for government, which we published in December, the government set out our commitment to learn lessons from the referendum uh, in terms of informing our future planning for further election campaigns. And that is exactly what the government will do to ensure that um, uh, once we have the necessary legislation in place, that young people are able to participate in the 2016 elections. That will only happen if we have sufficient legislative time to, um, to, to legislate accordingly. And to enable that to happen, we need a Section 30 order agreed by March of next year. Ms Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, this is a welcome step forward, and it seems to be now agreed that it's, it's the right way for 16- and 17-year-olds to have the vote. Is it now incumbent on Westminster to move towards votes for 16- and 17-year-olds in European and Westminster elections? Deputy First Minister. I think there is, there, there is no um, reason why that should not be the case, in my opinion. I think there will be a number of young people who participated in the referendum last September who will be somewhat disappointed by the, the fact that they cannot participate in the Westminster election that will take place in May of next year. So I do think the, uh, the, the case for uh, the extension of the voting franchise to 16- and 17-year-olds is unanswerable for all election contests, and I would encourage the United Kingdom Government to accede to this request and suggestion. Jackie Bailey. And I welcome the commitment given by the UK Government and indeed welcome the comments from the Deputy First Minister. Um, could he perhaps tell us what planning the electoral registration officers could do now in advance of the Section 30 order to ensure that we maximise registration for 16 and 17 year olds? Because I'm conscious that that does take quite a bit of time. First Minister. Well, first of all, can I extend a warm welcome to Jackie Bailey and her role to, um, uh, to, to shadow me in the parliament in, parliament in the period ahead. I look forward to 
uh, working with her as cooperatively as I have always worked with my uh, counterparts uh, in other parties, and I look forward to her contribution. On the substance of her question, uh, I think the, the, I think it's a, it's a matter of record, and actually this information is, I think, very timely, given the fact that the Electoral Commission has today published its assessment of the operation of the Scottish referendum. And I think that, well, the headline of the Electoral Commission's report is Scottish referendum well run and provides lessons for future referendums in the UK. So I think we can take a lot of confidence out of the arrangements that were put in place for the operation of the referendum. Uh, registration uh, was 97% uh, of the adult population registered to vote and in many circumstances, as we all know around the country, the electoral registration service had to go the extra mile to make sure that demand could be satisfied uh, of people wishing to register right up until the last moments of the registration window. So I think we, we will work very closely with electoral registration officers around the country in taking forward the legislation to ensure that we have, uh, have all the resources and the steps in place to ensure that everyone that wishes to be registered for the 2016 elections is able to do so, and particularly for 16 and 17 year olds. Um, I would say to, to, to Jackie Bailey that the, the key point for us um, is the necessity to have adequate time to legislate to do this properly and to enable that to happen this issue really needs to clear the United Kingdom Parliament by March of 2015, and we will work with the United Kingdom Government to enable that to be the case. Annabel Goldie. Presiding officer, the agreement by all five parties on the Smith Commission to give 16 and 17 year olds a vote in Scottish parliamentary elections, I think, was a very welcome and uh, constructive development. And I'm glad the First Minister found her recent meeting with the Prime Minister in this respect also positive and constructive. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister how does the Scottish Government propose to maintain and grow that positive relationship with the United Kingdom Government? Deputy First Minister. Well, as, as, as Ms Goldie knows, the Scottish Government is nothing but cooperative and helpful to the United Kingdom Government, and we look forward to that approach being reciprocated by our counterparts in the UK Government. I think to, to, the, the, there, there is a lot of good intergovernmental work goes on, but as Ms Goldie will know from her participation in the Smith Commission, there is also elements of the intergovernmental working system that needs to be improved, and I hope that the um, the recommendations of the Smith Commission in this respect are taken forward um, uh, effectively in the way that our early signals on 16 and 17 year olds give us confidence is going to be the case to make sure that some of the problems and issues that were identified in the Smith Commission can be appropriately addressed by the, uh, the joint working of both administrations. And I can say to Ms Goldie, on behalf of the Scottish Government, that we will do everything in our part to ensure that that is what is achieved as a consequence. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President. Officer, further to Claire Adamson's uh, first supplementary question, would the Cabinet Secretary be considering providing material aimed specifically at 16 and 17 year olds in the event that, uh, they might, that, that this might come through and they might be getting the vote? Would that be something the Scottish Government would be considering just now? Uh, well, well, certainly, what we will do, and we'll be, you know, what's important in preparing for any election contest where we're giving um, uh, material which can be used for voter education purposes. Um, we have to prepare that very carefully. We have to prepare it in a fashion that meets uh, the highest possible standards for its objectivity, which will be the government's objective in all of this respect. Um, and I think I'm, I'm certainly struck from my own experience of talking to 16 and 17 year olds during the referendum process, how much it was valued that some of the process of voting was demystified for young people. And I think the more we can do that, the more we can remove the barriers to participation in our democratic process, the, the, the greater democratic participation will be. I think it's pretty clear from the Electoral Commission's report that the work that was undertaken to ensure that we had properly prepared for the referendum, that people were informed about the process and were able to participate was a, big, a significant factor in contributing to the success of the referendum. And the government will want to learn the lessons from that in applying that to future parliamentary contests. Question two, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent Home Let report, which indicated that the average monthly rent in Scotland has risen by nearly 12 per cent in the last year. Minister, Margaret Burgess. Okay. I will start by congratulating Mary Fee also in her new position in the Shadow, Cab Shadow Cabinet. Um, 
In response to her question, Homelet reported that average rent in the month of November 2014 was 11.7% higher than in the month of November 2013. Previous Homelet reports, which are published every month, show wide variations. For example, for the month of October 2014, they reported an annual increase of 2.6% compared with the month of October 2013, and in September 2014, a decrease of 0.2% compared with two in the month of September 2013. So therefore, while they're reporting a rise of almost 12% for Scotland for November 2014, I would be cautious about how much can be read into one month's findings. The recently published Scottish Government statistics show that since 2010, 16 of the 18 broad rental market areas in Scotland have seen below inflation changes in average rents for two-bedroom properties, the most common size of property in the private rented sector. The Scottish Government is carefully monitoring rent levels and we are already exploring issues relating to rent levels as part of our consultation on the new private tenancy. Mary Fee. Thank you. As the Minister is well aware, statistics from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation show that a quarter of Scotland's poorest households are in the private rented sector, up from one in ten a decade ago, and around 23% of household income is spent on housing costs. Can the Minister explain then why she did not support Scottish Labour's cap and rent rises earlier this year? And will the Minister look again at this issue and reconsider? Minister. What I would say to the member is, and I have explained it in several times in this chamber, that the rent was not part of the initial housing bill when it was introduced. It did not come up as part of the consultation, nor was it raised with the exception of uh, Patrick Harvey and the Green Party. It was not raised with me um, when I offered to meet with all members of parties, including Mary Fee as shadow housing spokesman. What I did say at the time the bill was introduced, when we were looking at the private sector tenancy, we would look at that, we would consult that with stakeholders and with other political parties. And I know the um, Labour Party has already put in um, a response to the consultation. We believe that's the right way to do it, is to have as wide a consultation as possible in something that's going to have such significant impact as rents. And we are looking at that. And the consultation runs through the 26th of December. 28th of December, and it just wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on it at this stage. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. There's been a huge increase in the private rented sector, partly due to the lack of social housing and partly due to the lack of affordable housing. And there is a huge disparity across the country in the cost of, of, of renting um, in, in the private sector from, from Aberdeen, where it's many, many hundreds of pounds, and in the centre of Edinburgh, those figures are the same. Now, while I have a, a degree of sympathy with the idea of the market settling the rent and having a, a kind of equalised rent in an area, there are many, many thousands of people that say they cannot afford to pay their rent this month and they also fear that they will not be able to pay their rent in six months' time. We need action on this matter now. We don't need to wait till the end of a consultation. We need the Minister to step up and take action now. Minister. I think I say two things. We, we're addressing it in terms of the supply as well. We're increasing the supply of affordable housing because that is the best way to, to um, reduce the, the rents in the private sector, is to increase supply. And we're doing that. And we're well aware there are hotspot areas, such as uh, Mary Fee mentioned, in Aberdeen. And we're looking at ways of working uh, with the local authority and with housing associations to ensure that we can provide houses there for key workers who are struggling at the moment. So we believe we are doing it the right way. It is about consultation. We need to get that evidence. And I think both the, the report that Mary Fee referred to earlier and other reports on le le rent levels, we need to look at the evidence that's projected to see exactly what the impact of rent levels are across Scotland before we take action. That's precisely why we're consulting. And if action is required, we'll certainly take it. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Both uh, Mary Fee and the Minister have recognised that the situation with rent levels is not the same in all parts of the country. Doesn't that variation itself uh, reinforce the argument that a different policy response on rent levels will be appropriate in different parts of the country? There may well be places where the market, without any kind of intervention, is ticking along pretty nicely and, and satisfactorily, and other areas where it is deeply, deeply damaging to people's well-being, uh, both economically and the knock-on effect on their health. Surely a rental policy that recognises these regional variations is the way we should be going. Minister. 
I think I'll say again what I said. That's precisely why we're consulting, and that's precisely what the evidence is now showing, is that there are parts of the country where the increases are much greater than other, other areas of the country, and that's part of what we're consulting on just now. And it very well may be what Patrick Harving is suggesting could be the outcome. However, until we have the evidence in and all of the responses to the consultation, I wouldn't want to, to make any firm position on that. Alex Johnson. Would the Minister agree with me that the private rented sector provides a vital contribution to the uh, housing of many people across Scotland? And while other people have acknowledged already the significant differences that exist, it would be irresponsible for us to prejudge the consultation in such a way as to frighten the private rented sector and stimulate a contraction in that industry just when we need it most. Minister. I certainly agree that the private sector is a vital part of our housing system and it's one that the, the Scottish Government eh, is keen to, to, to grow and we've certainly funded um, the Building the Private Rector's a rented sector champion to do just that is to grow the private sector and I did say in response to my previous uh, question I'm not going to preempt the results uh, the, the consultation uh, other than to say that it is taking place and we'll look very closely at the evidence in that consultation to see how we take things forward. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 11877 in the name of Margaret Burgess on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button.